Hi, all, and thank you for tuning in to today's program with humorist Annabelle Gerwich and novelist Cynthia Sweeney. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now careening towards the end of our 25th season, which brings me right to Annabelle's new terrific book, You're Leaving When? She started it before the pandemic, so how could she know her opening line, it was the worst of times, it was the worst of times, would be so prophetic. Annabelle is a really, really funny writer, so there's no getting sentimental or whiny here. She sweeps you along in her adventures in downward mobility as she refers to midlife loss of security that in normal human beings would bring us to our knees. After the one, two, three punch hit of the dissolution of her marriage and the deaths of her parents in quick succession, more punches strike that lead to financial and emotional wallops. Life wasn't supposed to be like this but Annabelle is unbowed. She hits back with her great stories of resilience and creativity, taking in borders, joining the dating world and engaging in well-intentioned if excruciatingly hazardous do-it-yourself adventures. But Annabelle knows the secret to the best revenge. Notwithstanding financial and emotional injury, she stares down her bruising, torches it and laughs at it. Annabelle is not the only one here today who looks crisis right in the eye. Cynthia Sweeney tackles family crises one after the other, whether in her enormously best-selling first no novel, The Nest, or in her brand new novel, which comes out today, Good Company. Cynthia is a master of voicing thoughts all of us have had, but, not, but might not have been able to articulate. In exploring themes of marital and friendship, Betrayal, she suffuses her work with empathy, humor, and the beauty of forgiveness. I confess that I read Good Company in a single sitting, even though I fought myself to put the book down. The book won. Both of these books won. Both, uh, and, I, and I hope you'll visit our website to get a link to Chevalier's bookstore where you can get signed copies of Good Company and You're Leaving When. They're so terrific. You will have questions. Email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com and we'll try to answer them. And if you appreciate what we do, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to writersblockpresents.com. It's such a delight to present Annabelle Gerwich and Cynthia Sweeney. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Hi, Annabelle. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Hi, Cynthia. Um, I just there is, um, I was taking all these notes while I was reading your book and in the front, yeah, well, in the front, I just, I just have written, what kind of kid was she? <laughs> because I, I bet, like, like, like you, like, I just, first of all, whenever I find out that someone grew up in Florida, I'm, I'm always suspicious worried like worried i guess or i don't i don't think of people growing up in florida obviously you think of going people going to florida more towards the end of your life although i will say that three of the funniest women i know grew up in florida so um maybe that actually helps your world perspective but what i was wondering was like were you um were you appreciated were you funny always was that important to you always were you appreciated for it oh that you know it's such a funny question um i that's and the truth is i was not funny as a kid um i was which may have to do with florida because i just hated the heat so i was miserable all the time and it's different kind of heat than we have in los angeles which oh, by the way nothing yes it's awful yeah. It's, 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 it's the, it's the air is like soup, you know, it's, it's yeah. very, humid. and I mean, the funny thing is, of course, Cynthia, here we are, we live a few blocks from each other. So we have the same weather, you and I, um, but I hated the heat in Florida and the sun. Once I, once after I got over a very short period of like tanning with baby oil and the reflector thing, yes, I did that too late seventies. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and I went to see the Ramones play. I was like, Oh my God. So I stopped going outside and I was miserable. And so I was definitely not a funny person. I was just very, I was, you know, all I wanted to do was be an actress and that's what mm -hmm. I did for 
20 some years in my career. And I mean, I, I was not a funny person. I was like, a, and I was a theater kid, you know, and very morose. Just my biggest talent was I could cry on cue. So in terms of, was I funny? Was I that kid? No, but you know, I could ask you the same question because there's so much overlap in the themes of our books in, you know, um, identity and coming to a point in your life where you really have to uh, make choices, not based on emotion, but on some other sort of compass. And really you're at the precipice of a decision of how to, the rest of your life, a, a direction you're going to take. And that's both of our books take place at that point. And your writing is so reflective and you give us this deep inner life. So were you a kid who was always in touch? I have to ask you the same question. We're, yeah. we're... No, I, I was, um, you know, I was the oldest of four kids and I, my mom's Italian and that was sort of culturally, I mean, she's American, she's Italian American, but all of her grandparents were Italian and I grew up with that culture. And so everyone in my family is a big talker and everyone's loud. And so sort of the thing that, the thing that I did do was collect stories during the day. So at the family dinner table, everyone sort of talked about their day and the funnier you could be, the more time you got. So, so I, that was definitely something I was always accumulating stories, especially my dad and I would clean the kitchen together. And I always wanted to have a good story to make him laugh at the end of the day. Oh, that, is, so, that, that is really that, that's, a, that's, I can, I can totally see that. Well, not me. I just wanted to act and in, um, in very sad, tragic Jacobean dramas, which I trained to work to be Shakespeare. And I, that was my, gonna be my life in the theater. And, you know, that brings me to a question about your book. Um, the, in one of the interesting things in your book is this realization that one of the main characters Flora makes about life and this moment where she's reflecting on how she chose in her life her new family, the family she makes with her husband and daughter versus her a chosen family, the theater world mm -hmm. that she belonged to. Um, and she sees that as like, that was a turning point where she made a choice, but other characters made different choices. Mm -hmm. And I just, I wondered, I mean, first of all, I just related so much, but it was such an interesting way to see the world because I think readers will will recognize that in whatever world they come from, you know, whether whether you're come from the theater or another another subset community, a religious community, right. um, or another kind of profession that is very insular, um, which I think all professions ultimately become. As a friend of mine once said to me, you know how we feel about the world of acting? Plumbers feel the same way. You know, I, it's not, the book isn't about the theater world, but it is about this dichotomy and choosing between this chosen family and family. And I wondered how much of the driving theme that was for you, this idea of this, this, this life choice of who we, who we invest our, all of our energy into. I mean, there's so many themes, but that's one of them. And, and I wondered how much weight that carried in terms of your storytelling desire. You know, I think, um, I don't think I went into it consciously thinking about that, but I don't think it's a coincidence that I wrote about that shortly after I completely changed my life in the middle of my life. So I didn't start writing fiction until 10, 12 years ago, and I published my first novel at 55, and, um, and that was all wonderful, but it also made me question why I hadn't done what I wanted to do sooner. 
Huh. And I spent a lot of time thinking about, it's kind of like what happened. And, and what happened is I think what happens to all of us, which is like life was happening. Like I had, you know, I had a job I didn't love. Um, I had a kid. My husband got a much better job. He was working as a stand-up comedian when we met and got married. And then he got a television writing job. And oh my God, it was television writing money. And it was, um, and so it just, his job took priority because my job could barely even cover the expenses of a babysitter. And also I, I wasn't happy where I was working. So I was thrilled to be able to, kind of be the primary parent. And I always worked when my kids were little, I always freelanced, but I, I very much made the choice to accept work that would allow me to be the parent who was home a lot because my husband was never home because his job was so demanding. And I just know so many women who have, you know, Park Slope was full of them. We'd all go out for boozy Wednesday night, you know, uh, drinks and kind and talk about it. Like, what are we going to do? What's going to happen when these kids don't need us anymore? Because at that point that you, you could kind of see that coming. Um, and, and so I think that I, with, you know, the character of Flora, I just thought a lot about what, how she feels now about the decisions she's made that her daughter is going away. And, you know, it's one of those moments in everyone's lives where you sort of reevaluate your choices. Well, that's a, you. that's a funny thing. I mean, I think of our books when I read your book, I, and I got it months ago where we, we, we traded books and, um, it's funny, I think of our books as sort of companion, a nonfiction mm -hmm. and a fiction companion. I totally agree, yeah. It's so funny. There's because it just points to how pivotal that moment is. Both of our books take place on the precipice of great change in I don't want to say it's just in a woman's life, but in anyone's life when your kid is going off to school and to college. Um but it did, it did really surprise me how much of an impact that moment made on my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought that uh, somehow because I was a working mom, I'd always worked throughout my kid's childhood, um, that it wouldn't have that impact right. that I had sort of heard about or you know, experienced in my own life of the break of the, you know, leaving of the nest of the child because I was this working person. But then yeah. I hadn't actually realized how much motherhood had defined my sense of identity and just the daily life and also the community I was in. Of course, a bunch of other things happened that set off the stories in my book about this entering this new, I, I think it should be illegal to say the word chapter, but I'm going to say chapter. <laughs> <laughs> of your life but um but it's true but that's one of these defining moments and i think both of our main characters are you know being myself as a character uh you know are asking themselves who am i if this is not my daily way i identify and also the question of who am i if i am not you know just even entertaining the idea of a long-term partner or a wife in a marriage. And I, I think these are uh, very big questions that even whatever outcomes, and in some senses our books become divergent at a certain point of like, this one goes this way, one goes that way. But I think they both have a certain amount of ambivalence, I would say in them. and. When I first read a review of my book that mentioned the word ambivalence, I was a little upset by that. I sort of took that in a way of like, oh, does someone think that my writing is uncertain? And then I thought, oh, no, this is actually a really good thing because are we ever completely convinced of our choices? And I, I like to think that in the stories in my book, they reflect 
making choices and going off in a direction and adapting to a new normal Mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, still questioning that. And I actually really appreciated that about the characters and the decisions they make in your book. And I think in some sense, I don't want to say it's controversial. I don't think people are arguing about this, but there is a a sort of a, a kind of book that exists that's very popular right now that is um, these this kind of very certain female write, written book about either fictional or nonfiction that is an aspirational way to live full of aphorisms and and what's been called like Instagram evangelism right. of in a secular way. Yeah. And I just wondered what your thought was behind the choices that the characters make. I don't want to give spoiler alerts because it's yeah. just out, but people make choices that are not from, they're from, they're emotional, but they're also really, de- they're deliberating and there's no clear cut right. answers. And I wondered about how important that was to you. Um, Well, it's funny because one of the lines from your book that I typed out here that I thought if I had read your book, I would have put as um, an epigraph for my book (laughs) is there are times in our lives when the story we tell ourselves about who we are no longer matches up to the story we are actually living. And I feel like that's what both books are essentially about. And it's, and I feel like you know, what happens when you're around the age we are is your life isn't all possibility anymore. Right. right? So, um, and, and a funny thing happened when I started writing Good Company was a lot of my friends started getting divorced. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't have been surprising to me because it's a story as old as time, the kids get older, you know, the kids go away, the partners look at each other and say, oh, are we still good? And, but it did surprise me because I thought like we were smarter, like we were the smarter generation. Like we got married a little later. We had our kids a little later. We really, you know, worked, you know, how we could and as we could. And, um, and it really kind of shook me and I, I think I just sort of wanted to explore that. Like what happens when you are, you have to reckon with that moment in your life where the, where the choices you've made mm-hmm. have put you in a place that, not that it's completely fixed, but some things are no longer mutable. So you, and you, you know, you have to live with that. You have to live in the story that you are in. You, you can yeah. no longer like project yourself into some other life entirely. Right. You know, that's, that's a funny thing too. I mean, I think that that's also a trend. I sometimes call that the resilience prison or the reinvention prison that women get seem, seem to get put in. Like take two reinventions and call me in the morning. Like there's this idea that there's always this new reinvention. Now, not that I am anti reinvention, but What if, say, you've already reinvented many times? And what if there's a world in which your goal is to adapt or to find a way of living the life you're actually living? What if that's your best reinvention? Is the one that doesn't look like everything's new, but you want to inhabit your life in a different way. And I think that's, that's, that was what I was interested in. And I, and I was interested in the idea of (laughs) just, I'm laughing when I think about it. Could this not be a story with a terrible ending? You know, (laughs) like, you know, could there be uh, a story that had, and could my own story, because I'm always, you know, uh, thinking, you know, as myself as the main character, but also reflecting on the choice I'm making. Mm -hmm. Um, But is there a way that we carve out an identity that 
is simply about inhabiting our lives in a different with a different understanding because maybe reinvention isn't the best idea. Right. So I knew when I started writing this book, also because the experiences were already, you know, lived, I always feel I need a certain amount of detachment before I'm writing about something, you know. Um, so I knew that I wanted this book to have this, I don't want to say necessarily like, well, it's a hard word, hope, hopefulness, but I, the, the word I think I've used in my mind is buoyancy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel that there was um, a sense of buoyancy, even at, amid, after all the losses that right. I've written about, and even just the change of like, just embracing this idea of being a family elder in a buoyant right, sense right, of, right. of, love, of like, yeah. could I find joie de vivre in yeah. being a family elder that I am now closer to being when I realize I'm one of the, the, the elder generation of my even saying that is terrifying. And I want to sit up straighter so I don't get the- uh, Dowager's hump, yeah. Dowager. Yes, <laughs> yes, the dowager hump. Um, but I wondered if for you, when you were interested in this point, did you have an end point that you already knew you were heading towards in the novel? Um, <clears throat> I always have, I had a writing teacher who um, gave me a great piece of advice once, which was, you don't need to know the end of the book, but it helps to know where you're leaving your characters off, like how they're going to continue emotionally. Like what is the emotional note that you're leaving them off on? So, um, and, I, and I went back and forth a little bit uh, as to what that emotional note was going to be. And um, without giving anything away, a few people read the first draft and felt like it was very bleak for one of the couples and which I didn't, but, but I, but I, I, I realized that I like, I got that from a lot of people. Like if I had only gotten it from one person, I might've, my rule is sort of like if three people complain about something, there's probably a problem there. And so, um, but I also, you know, I really like endings that aren't tied up into a neat bow where they yes. give you enough information yeah. so that you feel satisfied and, um, at, but, but not so much information so that every little strand is settled. And I like it when I finish a book and I feel satisfied, but I'm also, um, have some questions about the characters after the book ends, you know, like what's going to happen yeah. to them. And um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's always kind of, I'm always sort of working toward a feeling more than, more than an event. That's, I, it's interesting you said that because I feel the same way, even though my books are always, I mean, up till now I write essays that are all on a theme. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know in a particular like where it's ending, but I know the feeling. Right. And it's funny, like this is really a companion book to my book, I See You Made an Effort, mm -hmm. which is written on the edge of 50. And I really wanted, I knew that that book had to end on a triumphant note, right. you know? And so the last scene in that book, you know, the, I'm jumping on a trampoline, sure, I'm wearing jeans and it's a little unfortunate <laughs> to be dropping a trampoline and light colored jeans and it's not really a great moment, but and the pool is coming and I'm you know on the trampoline with my kid rest you just a, just but but it's a triumphant note, you know, I'm just gonna take my old lady hands and just keep going. Um, this book I wanted to end on a note of I would say I never I really hate this word. That's okay. And phrase. <laughs> Cuz I make fun of it in the book. You know, I would say like in some down down the street from us there's someone teaching a class on radical swiffering. Right. But I wanted this book to note to end on a note of like of 
the radical acceptance. That was to me the the place I wanted to land. That's exactly what my alarm just went off because I just want to remind everyone to send in their questions to reservations at writersblockpresents.com because um, because Annabelle would love to answer some questions. So, um, but I think that is that is not just the end of the book, but it's evident throughout. Like really, in each essay, there is you you capture that buoyancy and you capture this that sense of um i mean it really does feel like someone at a crossroads leaning and i hate this phrase too but like leaning into it like not like not not looking for the instagram evangelism of all the things that are going to change your life which by the way all cost like a million dollars right so it's for it's right really for um a small part of the population who can go off to some retreat and you know meditate and get massages and envision happiness or whatever happens there but um but but like someone who's really taking your circumstances and um like putting air underneath them yeah, you know, I, I, well, I, I so appreciate that because I, I also had, I was trying to follow the Bechtel rule yes. in, 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 in media, which yes. was that I wanted there to be conversations between women and also with, with myself that didn't involve men. And, 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 and I felt that was like a really strong mandate for me that a book about identity and midlife, mm -hmm. really midlife, this is that other terrible word, reckoning, you know, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted that to, to not be, and in particular, because the sub, I had subtitled the book, Adventures in Downward Mobility, you know, there could not be a redemption that involved uh, the finding of a, 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 a man coming yeah, being a rich guy. Yeah. Or a, a guy or even another relation or any kind of relationship. I didn't want there to be the relationship redemption. I didn't want there to be the Greek Island, uh, uh, redemption of travel. I didn't want the redemption to be, and then I lost that last five, whatever, it just, it yeah. had to be a totally internal shift. Get into my skinny jeans and yeah. walk into the sunset. Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, I, there were a lot of things I, I just had eliminated because, you know, one of the things I do in the book is also talk about the, the uh, failure to uh, live the Nancy Myers. Yeah, that gotta have it. one of yeah. my favorite parts of the book yes oh, thank you and and then also the being part of the calgon uh take me away generation that you can't buy the bra the brow the bag the bathcation that's going to change everything and and so you know it was really a more a subtle more subtle thing i was trying to write to um and i i did have that it's funny it was a, it wasn't it was an emotion right um, as a destination but now one when you're starting out with your novels you you just said that you had this interest right in in examining this idea do, where do the when do the characters come in are you writing to the themes first or to the characters first or is that just how does that what's the process of that i don't even think about theme because i don't think that works with fiction huh. um at least it doesn't work for me, but I, the characters have to come in very quickly. And so that's the hardest part because it takes some time to, um, it takes some time to develop characters. And I just kind of let myself go a little bit and, and do some world building. And, and then at a certain point, much like life, <laughs> you've made enough choices so you you have a direction. Mm -hmm. So you put enough things and you've thrown enough balls in the air. So you just get to a point where you say, okay, I have to resolve all of these things now. And then that's kind of the rest of the book. So when you when you're writing the, the characters, because they're so interesting, the women in the book, their friendship. 
um, everyone who reads this, your book is going to recognize themselves and their friends in these people um, because they're so human. You know, um, you, you're not using them or, or, do, or does that come at a certain point when you are thinking about them as representative of something or, or they're just people distinct who then make their choices or do you think I, I need to- try and, Yeah, no, I really just try and think of them as people mm. because um, I think that when, you know, again, when I was writing my first novel, I was at the end, I went back to school, I went back to graduate school um, when I was 50 and uh, started the nest at the very end of that. And I was asking one of my teachers sort of about like, well, what's the theme? And he said, that's not for the writer to figure out. That's for the reader to figure out. Like that is not useful to you as a writer. They just have to be people, you know, moving through this world. And when I think about what they're going to decide or what their choices are, mm -hmm. I imagine, I don't know this, but I, maybe it's like being on the stage where you just try and get to a very human place and think, what would someone really do in real life in this? Huh. Like not, you know, like not what would the person who represents, I don't know, uh, uh uh, I'm making I don't speak theater speak. So. <laughs> no, I was saying making making their career their most important. Yeah, yeah. Or just or just trying to think. I just really try and inhabit the person while I'm writing that person. And you know, I knew at the beginning once I sort of figured out what the plot was, I uh -huh. I, I had an idea of what choices people were going to make within that world. But the fun of it for me is um, surprising yourself when you're writing. So yeah, the best days, you know, yeah. not the days where you're sort of churning out a transition or getting everyone from one place to another, but the days where you're just sort of exploring what's happening and then something happens and it surprises you and it works. And those are, sort of the days that keep me going. Yeah, uh, you know, that would just remind me, I mean, I I am writing into on two tracks. So I'm always writing uh, stories uh -huh. um, and then I'm writing themes. And, tr and so I know that I, I'll have a list, you know, for each of my books, you know, I have a, a list. So for this book, I needed, I felt I needed essays that, addressed a number of issues that had to do with identity and so was who the identity in family identity in terms of where you're living identity with motherhood and so there's all these um conditional the conditional self right. right so there were all these themes and then i had all these stories and so a really good writing day for me is when i understand um, how a story, when I understand what that story can do in terms of right. fitting in. Right. And then it also helps me to decide if it belongs in this collection. It is funny, you something you said earlier. So of course, like every author, there's like three different versions of this book that exist yeah. that did not, that I didn't publish. And I also had um, some readers some for some of the early chapters that do not appear actually mm -hmm. <laughs> um say i don't i i, I don't want to say the word bleak but maybe you know right. and and then also uh i think that had to do with um time passing and me understanding a story in a different way and um because for me it, comedy is really important yeah. in a book it's it's just really important it's yeah. it's important as a as a sort of a as, as a lens to see the world and also as just a way to live you know yeah. Yeah. and I wondered how you felt about that because well I just want to say there's this one line that I when I read this line I thought I would write an entire 
chapter just to find a place for this line. It was so funny. And I wondered, like, did this, does this, was this a line you were looking for a home for, or did this really come? I can't wait to hear this. Okay. Um, it's just, uh, even the garbage in New York was aspirational. At least in Los Angeles, it was all concealed in a huge plastic bin. The garbage in New York was aspirational. That just made me laugh because I, that's something I thought about, but I never could have articulated. It's just so funny. And it comes in a moment that's completely unexpected. This is not, um, this is not a cultural commentary. This is, but this character notices this. And I'm like, well, that's a great line. I can tell you exactly. How holding that on to that. Where did that come from? Yeah, How does that fit? When I, um, there's been New York in, um, in most of my books. And so um, there was a scene written at the Delacorte Theater and Shakespeare in the Park. And in, yes, despite living in New York City for 27 years, I had never been to the Delacorte. And <laughs> so I went back a couple of summers ago. I, I did a few things that weekend. I took um, uh, a theater workshop. It was called Devising Within a Democracy um, by the woman who was the director for Hades Town. I'm oh, interesting. Thinking. Yeah. Um, and I went to Shakespeare in the Park and I wanted to figure out where Flora and Julian lived when they were younger. And so of course I went back to a neighborhood that I lived in when I was a new mom, which was the far West village. And I was just walking around on a Saturday trying to think like, where would their apartment be? And, um, and there was a, <laughs> there was a clear recycling plastic garbage bags. It was a Saturday morning uh -huh. and they were full of very expensive wine bottles. And I just had this memory of walking around, you know, I lived in the far West village, like on the West side highway, but, uh -huh. of course I'd bring the kids to Washington square park or to, you know, all these different playgrounds in the heart of Greenwich village. And I remember walking around and seeing people's garbage and feeling envy. <laughs> how, how could you have that many bottles of wine? You know, how could you afford to have people over to your apartment and go through that much beautiful wine or just, you know, people would throw furniture out or whatever. Like I just, it was those, it was those early years when I was a new mom and we had a great apartment deal that I thought we could never ever leave because God forbid you give up your cheap rent in New York city. And, and I really was struggling with what was going to happen to us. You know, Mike was doing stand up, and I was freelancing and I just thought, what have we done? We've had this child and, 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 you know, how are, how are, like, how are we going to build a life? How are we going to create a life? And I didn't want to leave New York city. And, and it weighed on me all the time um, until, until Mike got, you know, the job writing for Conan where he still is today. And that's, so, that's so funny. I, you know, um, this is of all my books, this book is a book about living in Los Angeles. Right. And so is, is your book. And I didn't realize that, okay, I lived in the West Village too, in a horrible apartment that the floor was slanted. And when you open the bed, you would be at the front door. It didn't have a kitchen sink. It was just this tiny place in the West Village. But I have to know, where do our main characters in your book live? What street? What did you decide on? I, I don't, I think if I gave it a street, I think it's Barrow Street. Uh-huh. Because I lived on West between Bar on, on West Street between Barrow and Morton. So I think I just, you know, gave them some little, one of those old pre-war walk up, you know, tiny yes. apartments. Yeah. So. Yes. So I, just have to have, I want to have that pictured in my mind, but I, that, that line just struck me as so, uh, such a great observation. But it, did. I feel it, popped, it popped into my mind and I wrote it down in my little notebook and I was like, oh, that's going in the book. <laughs> that's so. so funny. It actually had to do with the story though. For me, I feel like a line like that would be something I just 
file away. And then I try to find a way to fit that in the book. Oh, I do that too. And, and, you know, I would say that works like 20% of the time. Right. You know, right. So well, how, how much, what did you feel you humor? Like, was it, did you have a, a an idea of like, I, this book should be, have humor? I mean, just, it's just so, I mean, it's, it's so it's funny. It's very important to me to be funny. I just always want to make people laugh. So I, in fact, one of my goals in life is to write a truly comic novel and which I haven't done yet. I think my books have a lot of humor in them and they are funny, but I really admire people who can just falls to the wall, make it hilarious. And I do too. Um, I do too. And I, I, I struggle with that sometimes because I'm always um, drawn to really subjects that are that I feel demand a mix of humor and also just deep consideration. Um, and then I think after I finish a book, wait, wasn't I going to set out and just write it just funny, just, just, just the jokes, just the, the highlights of the jokes. Um, but I, maybe that doesn't ultimately sustain my interest because that's never what I end up with. I think that's probably true. And I also think that, um, you know, you obviously are a person who um, feels deeply for the people around her, um, for the people around you and the people, um, the people in your life who are struggling. And so at a certain point, I mean, I thought one of the most beautiful chapters in the book was a chapter where you take in the young teens who are homeless, houseless, um, and and it's a very it's funny, but it is also um, a treatise about homelessness in Los Angeles, and and you know I mean that's that like you could make that just a lot of jokes, but it was much more effective when you sort of took that turn into treating a very serious subject with tenderness. I, you know, it's not even seriousness. It's like a tenderness. Well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, that was a chapter that I originally wrote as a, um, uh, an essay in the, I published in the LA times. And then there was so much more I wanted to write about that story. And so I knew I wanted to include that story in the book. You know, it lives also in a, in a, next to a chapter about when I took in a French tenant who right. turned my right. home right. into, you know, a, a dormitory that <laughs> smelled like a French brasserie. I mean, people would stop me on the street. The smell of weed so infused my, cl my clothing, my hair. I was like, I was living in a dispensary. People, where's the local, you know, all of LA smells like a dispensary, but it, it really does crazy. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was coming from my house. It was all coming from my house. Um, but this mix, I mean, that's just, it is funny when you said that though, about like wanting to write a comic novel. I really do, I, I love that. And yet ultimately that's not what draws me in, you know. Oh, and do you want to take some questions? Ooh, do you? I do. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, if there are some questions. Um, I will, before Andrea pops up, I did want to ask you one thing. Okay. Um, one of the things I love so much was when Anne Mira told you not to like do comedy with your husband, like not to be an act. Yes. And I just like, what, like, like, what was she really, like, I think I know what she was saying, but I mean, I guess what, like, I'm just curious as to what your take is on that. Like what, you know, I think what Anne was saying, and Anne was just a dear friend and just so encouraging of my writing, and that meant so much to me. But I, I mean, you know, she and Jerry were just fantastic. What she was really saying was, don't be taken in by the way things look. And, you know, really look beyond the, to the effect of what that does to your relationship. But I mean, it really in the larger sense, you know, Anne was just really interested in, I mean, she's also was a playwright and she had many more aspirations than working as a comedy team. And I think she just didn't want me to get 
mesmerized by the prospect of of that of that as a vehicle because she wanted to both she loved performing with Jerry in that part of her career but she also wanted to have an identity yeah. separate from that and I, I so I've also felt that was a very um it was a comment that had to do with also identity and being a woman and yeah. making sure you had your own space yeah. for creativity hi Andrea hi Andrea hi there. <laughs> we have some questions um the first is from me um Annabelle you wrote a great piece in the New York Times uh, about how the coronavirus and a COVID test saved your life. Um, and that, and from that test, you learned you had lung cancer. So my question is, how are you doing? Uh, you know, um, thank you for asking that. Yes, this is, uh, again, when I wanna just write comedy, life intervenes and um and yet humor is the way i'm sort of sustaining myself along with some amazing gene targeted medication that is newly developed and I'm, I'm doing really well and um it is interesting when you are really pressed it to the you know to what is your threshold for the redemptive power of humor it has been really interesting to see that that remains my commitment and you know i still feel like that is what the lens through i that i see the world in and i will just keep making jokes about the juicers that people send to me <laughs> the pictures because i wrote about how people give you a juicer when you get cancer and then you don't use it. And people, all, when I wrote that in the Times, I got emailed pictures of people's abandoned juicers. And that made me laugh so hard. And I just thought I will must keep this sense of humor. Uh, so I appreciate that question. Um, I, I wonder if you've considered writing about that topic next, you know, in terms of a book, humor and cancer and what publishers, how they respond to that. Because um, it was dicey 20 years ago when I talked to a publisher about my experience and I said, I have this idea for a really funny book on dealing with cancer, you know, as a, you know, as I lived it. And so, um, and they were just like, no, it's not, that's not going to be funny. It's just not funny. So I'm wondering. Well, yeah, uh, I, uh, we'll find out in about a month and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when, I, when I take out the new book that I'm, that I'm working on of, that I'm tentatively titling, I'm sorry, I don't look sick enough for you. <laughs> okay, good. So, Here's we'll to see. it. Here's we'll to see. it. Um, by the way, can I can I just add one thing just for people who are with us today, um, just, you know, that, that you'll get to know uh, about our Cynthia and my two books that I think is just so funny. Is that okay if I reveal that you're in my book, Cynthia? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just a funny thing about when life, imi art imitates life. Uh, in the book, I write about... Um, how I know my kids' future, who my kid's a musician, they're in college, and I know their future because I have a friend and I can't remember what I named you, <laughs> but at this point, what, what's my name? What's your name in the book? Carla. Carla. I don't know why I did that, but I just wanted to, you know, be careful. But anyway, so I talk about my friend Carla's kid, who's a musician who works in restaurants and that I would be silly if I didn't know what that was going to happen. So um, my kid graduates Bard, comes home, and uh, about a month ago got hired in a local juice bar uh, by Cynthia's kid. So our kids are working together. together. It's crazy. That is crazy. And but my son no longer lives at home. So there you go. And my, my kid no longer lives at home, but it is hilarious when I go and I visit them at the, at the juice bar. And I think 
did I write this into be? I've been wanting no, them to meet for years. It is crazy. It is crazy. So fun. Because at one point we were at a party and you said to me, let's get them together. And our friend Janelle said, oh yeah, because teenage boys love to be fixed up on a blind date. <laughs> <laughs> they found each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Um, uh, was there a book you read when you were younger that had a major impact on the direction of your life? If so, what was it and how did it affect you? Ooh, Cynthia, do you want to answer that first? Um, you know, I think that um, when I was younger, I was loved like many young writers. I loved Anne of Green Gables and that whole series of books because she was a writer and she loved language and, and her female friendships were really important to her. And I feel like that, um, that definitely, in ways I didn't really understand, except in retrospect, uh, definitely put some ideas in my mind. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, uh, I was a science fiction fanatic as a kid. <laughs> I don't really remember the earliest books, but I would stay home from school to read. I was really into it to sort of point like Isaac Asimov and read the Dune series. I was just the Tolkien. I was a Tolkien kid. I was that kid. I, and I, you know, and then I, I made my own Star Trek uniform. I mean, I was a total science fiction person. Which explains nothing about me now. I I don't know. The sense of possibility, the um, absurd, absurdity, the acting. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, because then I ended up, of course, my very first job in New York as an actress was with the New York Shakespeare Festival, just by the oh. way. Doing a very serious Jacobean tragedy. So well, I just went in a complete opposite direction when I turned about, it was about 40. Annabelle, you mentioned that you weren't funny when you were younger living in Miami. Now that you've done comedy all over the place, do certain cities have funnier people than others? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, gosh, no. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, and but this is of course just, just really hard for me right now. Like I am a big book tour person. I love going to, you know, that's a great way to see the country is, is to meet readers and, and you get to know people. And we you know part of this book was uh, inspired by someone I met in winter park, Florida on a book tour. Um, when I was with uh, doing the, the Jewish book council tour and a woman was telling me about this time in her life, you know, post-marriage and kids leaving and that all she had in her refrigerator was vodka and gelato, like uh, <laughs> everything practical and disappeared. And I was like, that'll never happen to me. And that's exactly what happened to me. But it was so funny. And we're sitting at a, maybe an olive garden in, uh, in, in Winter Park, Florida. I mean, I just, I just am always listening for great material everywhere. And I don't, think that there's a funnier city except no I, no I, and I uh, but I do I am really grateful that all of the plays that I did with the Temple Beth Shalom players were not filmed because I played Linda in Death of a Salesman at <laughs> like 12 <laughs> and I would be I would have to be a sh well I would have to I would never have gone into acting if that footage existed because <laughs> And then I was Bruma, Bruma, Bruma Sarah in Fiddler on the Roof. Uh -huh. I, I was never even a daughter. <laughs> I was a ghost. Yeah. So yeah, luckily, whew, not filmed. Um, okay. Here's, here's one. Uh, you were famously fired by Woody Allen when he was directing his off-Broadway play called Writer's Block. No relation at all to Andrea's Writer's Block which is the most important distinction for me. Okay, so if you could rewrite that moment, what would you say to him? 
Oh, uh, you know, um, whew, that's a really long, long answer that I won't give the entire long answer, but I had always heard because he's such a misanthrope, I'm going to leave certain things aside that, that John Turturro, after auditioning for Woody once and encountering the misanthropic personalities said to him, you're, you're not a nice person. <laughs> and I, I feel like I, I wish I had actually just said that. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's the very short answer. And I've thought about a lot of other answers and a lot of questions since then. I, I don't really talk about that publicly at this point because there's much bigger issues, yeah. but um, not you're not, you're not a very nice person is, would have been a very one way to put it. That, yeah, that covers a lot of ground. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Cynthia, do you ever have regrets that you didn't start writing earlier? Mm. Um, I don't. I, I do wonder if I had started earlier, you know, would I be farther along? Would I, with every book you learn a lot. Um, but I, I honestly think that um, I don't want to read the book I would have written at 28 mm -hmm. or even at 38. Yes. And, and so I think I probably started when I was ready to start. I'm just ex incredibly grateful whenever I, I really try not to traffic in regret. It's such a slippery slope and with no, there's nothing good at the end of that slope. Um, and also I am just, whatever regret I have is so um, outweighed by the incredible good fortune I've had as a writer. So I am just so grateful that people have responded to the books I've written, so. Annabelle, um, for many of us, life stood still for this past year. What was the process for reflection and growth like for you? Um, and then I'm throwing in with your diagnosis and the changes in your life. Did you even have time for reflection this past year as time stood still for all of us? You know, um, one of the things that was happening during COVID was I was editing this book and it was, it was really hard. I mean, I think a lot of people who were writing and what well, was so many challenges for so many people, it seems even terrible to even talk about a writing challenge. But for me, what happened was also with this diagnosis was here I am someone without symptoms, right? being told I have this disease on a scan outside myself. So I'm getting this information about myself so that, that there was a lot of reflection at this moment about feeling like I, and while I was editing, if I didn't know myself, I didn't, someone could tell me something about myself that was so different than my actual experience. This is in terms of my health. How could I trust myself mm -hmm. as a writer? Mm -hmm. Because maybe I, my instincts were all wrong. I had a, a like a dissociative experience. Mm -hmm. It was really so hard. It was sort of a miracle. I finished the book and was able, I couldn't make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something a lot of people have experienced in different levels with COVID of this difficulty in making decisions because um, it's hard to see the effect of decisions when you're so isolated. And I've been a, a, a safer at home person by myself for a lot of this pandemic. And um, I think that's been so challenging in terms of just besides the changing from my night pajamas to my day pajamas and the, the, you know, the, the, just the functioning in daily life, but just the sense of who I am separate from the world. Mm -hmm. So it's been a lot of reflection and I, I do feel, and I, 
you know, I had to also think about this book coming out during COVID. And I feel that I, I, I am really, that this book is turned out to be even more timely mm -hmm. than I expected because I was reflecting on these issues while I was writing this book. And um, I, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I feel good about that. But I, I think um, it, it's been a very uh, reflective time. And also like many people, I have also appreciated more the very little things like just uh, the connections with people. And I don't sound too sentimental, but I think so many of us have come to appreciate these small things, like just even that, oh, I think about uh, the last writer's block we did together and just a connection with you, Cynthia, and the writing community and our neighborhood in Los Angeles. So I think, you know, ultimately, like so many people, just having a profound sense of connected, of the appreciation of the connectedness mm -hmm. of all of us. And that is also why I'm writing. And I, and I, I have to imagine why Andrea, you do what you do and Cynthia, what we do is in order to foster more connection. And so in some way, um, this has just been emphasized by the whole pandemic experience. And um, I uh, feel it just even more profoundly than normal, than, than in the before times. And I, in some sense, I hope we all can keep that going because that's also a beautiful thing. I'm going to end with um, with this question. And thank you. That was a, a gorgeous, you know, a gorgeous answer. And I, while you were saying it, I thought, oh, that's a perfect place to end. Oh, that's a perfect place to end. But I, I like this question. And so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you and maybe you can make it a perfect place to end. I'm putting it on you. No pressure. <laughs> I know. Is it easier to write little funny pieces about your own life and experience than it is to write about subjects other than yourself, like the movies you, that you, oh my God, they were so funny in this book, people. This book is so good. But um, when you write about yourself, you know, is it, was, the, was that easier pre-pandemic and editing it during the pandemic, you know, what? How did you find writing about you different from writing about, I guess? That's that's so much harder to write about. I mean, let me just want to say, I don't think I'm that interesting. I just, I do, uh, uh, I'm using myself as an example. I'm like a, 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 a the lab rat, you know, for, for the things I'm writing about and for a woman living in this time dealing with these situations. I don't really think I'm really, I think it's my ordinariness. Just, you know, I mean, facing all the issues of downward mobility in midlife, I, I'm really pretty ordinary, but it's harder. I, I love writing cultural commentary that I've included in the book, like the movies uh, about aspirational women versus uh, the experience of most of us are living. Under um, the Tuscan sun, there you go. Yeah, under the Tuscan sun. <laughs> that's really just pure fun for me. That's, I mean, I think deeply, but it's also really fun. It's much harder to write, I think with, you know, nuance, ambivalence and really deep reflection using myself because oh it's much more complicated you know and that's so that's 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 the harder that's the harder task and i you know and and also you know just trying to think who in my life do i care will still be speaking to me after this is published you know that's always a big one well, but we'll be reading you no matter what. And like, who cares who's speaking to you, but we'll be reading you and, and, and Cynthia too. So um, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing both of you again soon. Go to Chevalier's uh, and find Annabelle's book, You're Leaving When, and Cynthia's brand new novel that comes out today. You'll also find that was signed copies at both places.
I mean, at Chevalier's, you'll find both books at that one place. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks, everybody. It's so fun. Bye-bye.